Hi everyone, my name is Darius. If you're watching this video, you may be a worship leader who's considering moving to a click and guide system for your worship team. Or you could be a band member who's trying to decide whether or not it's something you want to engage in. Well, I hope by the time you get to the end of this video, you will see that this is really a great idea. You really ought to do this for the quality of music for your worship team. Now, I say that with the one qualification, sometimes you have a church that has so many gifted and talented musicians that they don't need a whole lot of help, but I don't know too many churches like that. And this is especially for small churches. I am here to help you with your small church to a small or medium-sized church, or really any size church, to try to help you have a better music program. And the click and guide system is one that uh, has worked for us, and it's, it's worked well. I, I did not actually train as a musician. This was not my goal. I went to college to be an academic. I taught at a university, the University of Johnson University, I taught Bible things there, Greek and whatnot. And um, I uh, also um, uh, have been in, in various churches as minister, senior minister and so forth over the years. But every church I've been at, at some point or another, I have been the worship leader, <laughs> just about if I was at that church very long at all, uh, because of the fact that people recognized that I had some kind of talent that I didn't even recognize in myself for music, even though I am not the guy you would go to hear play guitar, I'm not the guy you'd go to hear sing, I'm not going to wow you on the keyboard or anything like that. Uh, I, I had a, a year of French horn in, in the elementary school in eighth grade. I took piano from grades four to six. And uh, beyond that, I really didn't do anything. No vocal training. Uh, I picked up the guitar on my own at age 24 and just started playing rhythm. So uh, I've, I've come a long way through this. I've used it as worship, uh, as, as youth leader at, uh, at church, and uh, I've used it in the pulpit uh, as you know, leading worship. I've done cantatas and things. Um, so anyway, the, the bottom line is, is that as the worship system has developed over time, we have gotten to the point of having click and guide uh, issues here. And I'm going to encourage you through demonstration by watching some A and B comparisons here between tracks, uh, why this is really a great thing. And this is, this is the way to go for the, the best quality for your band overall. And uh, that's what your worship leader is about. Your worship leader is about trying to provide the best quality that you possibly can for the worship service. So let's get into this. I'm going to show you, you see down here in the corner, my little um, doll. This is Studio One. I'm a Studio One aficionado. I love it. And what I'm going to do for you here is I'm going to play three different tracks side by side. Same song. We're looking at the song Hosanna by Hillsong, which was always one of the band's, well, it was the band's favorite song to play. Uh, it's a beautiful song. I love it. Like I do a lot of the Hillsong stuff. And uh, what I've got here is I've got a yellow version. The yellow version was recorded in 2018, so it's five years old at the time of this recording. And um, that version was recorded live at Lighthouse, where I was the worship leader. And uh, I'll tell you some more about that in just a second. The, uh, the blue version on the bottom was recorded just this year. In fact, just this last week. Um, we're not finished with it yet. This is still a working version. But it's a version I've done here at the house. Uh, it includes only me and my voice and my wife's voice and a lead guitar, an acoustic guitar by uh, Mr. Jeremy Hall, who is a friend and who was my lead guitarist at. Uh, at the church. So um, the, um, the story goes kind of like this. The, the yellow version, you'll hear a particular female lead singer on it. And we had a professional drummer. And he was just volunteer professional. He was professional, but he was volunteering for us. Um, he was always complaining to me that, uh, you know, we're not as tight as we should be as a band. The singers don't follow me right. And and, you know, they're pushing and pulling and we're coming in wrong. So there were always little issues along the way with timing. Most of the time at the church, we did not have a system where I could do much about that. I tried to start solving it when I introduced tablets for lyrics 
We did not have a projection system on the back wall at that time. So I, I, the, the tablets had a set list helper on them. You can see a great little program that you can use, set list helper. Go look it up. And um, it uh, had a, a metronome on the bottom. And I was encouraging the singers and the musicians to play with the metronome at home and to even turn it on during performance to help keep them on track. And I was encouraging the drummer to use it to get himself started on time. And, uh, but beyond that, once we got started, you know, pretty much most of the people didn't, didn't look at it or follow it very much. They were listening for the drummer, uh, if they were. That was part of the problem. Part of the problem was is that uh, you know, the singers, a lot of them, a lot of them didn't have any real interest in or knowledge of music. And they just, like a lot of small churches, they just memorized things by rote and then tried to repeat it back. And that worked most of the time. The girl who's singing on this one did a really nice job on uh, a lot of songs for a lot of years for us. And um, the um, as time came on, the we had another bass player had joined us at this particular point. And uh, later on, we had a new drummer and his wife joined uh, as well. The new drummer was not as good as the original drummer. And uh, he, he had timing issues. We tried platooning the two, rotating them off every other week. And practices got really stressful because he was more spongy, more accordion-like in, in his timekeeping. And so we spent a lot of time, a lot of frustrating time, uh, trying to, you know, make sure that we were all together and things were going the way that they should be. And, and then I would try to mix some of the recordings that we had. And with his drumming, it was extremely hard. I failed more than I succeeded in making those things match up the way they were supposed to. Um, to make a long story short, that family had some issues at the church, and they didn't like the idea that in 2020 we had done a remodel and got in-ear monitors and were setting up a system that we were going to be moving to a click-and-guide system. Uh, it was something I was developing, all of the tracks I did on my own because I didn't want to have to deal with anybody's copyright issues. So I was doing everything from scratch from the ground up. And because of that, um, we wound up uh, parting company with these folks, and they took this female lead singer with them. They went to another church. So somebody knew that I was working on this song, Hosanna, and they said, you ought to listen to what's going on at this church. So I did listen, and I could see the point here. And I want to use this not, not really to dog these people. They're doing what they want to do the way they want to do it. Uh, they didn't like my ideas. They didn't think I knew what I was talking about. They you know, had a lot of negative things to say. But uh, in the end, if I was Rush Limbaugh, I would say, see, I told you so. Because you're going to see, demonstrated in this, what happens in small churches all across this nation every Sunday. Sloppy performances that detract from the song and detract from the worship. And I want to help you get out of that and get away from that. So we're going to listen to some of these, so, these, these cuts here. And I'll I'll talk you through them a little bit. So the first one is the lighthouse cut. The second one is the cut from this particular church that was recorded this year. And the third one is the one that my wife and I and, and Jeremy have put together. Um, and basically, I do all the work on this. All this, Everything that's not the guitar or the, the female vocal is stuff that I've done here. And I've done it at the house. So... You know, you can put together this kind of quality service uh, on, on your laptop computer if you so desire to. And that's what uh, I do as a worship leader. That's the way I, I like to do things because I'm always pushing for the higher quality. You know, when I would have a new guitarist show up who was good, I would add them in, right? You know, so you, you add things that are good, but people don't always want to go along with you. And just be aware of that. You've got to be able to tell them no, and you've got to be able to say goodbye to people, too, uh, even people that are popular. We'll talk more about that. Listen to this intro here. This is Lighthouse. This is a tempo of about 80.
Okay, that's a tempo of about 80 when we did that song back in 2018. Okay, 2018. It's been a while. We didn't have any good click tracks at that point. At the most, we might have been using the visual metronome, and that's about it. Otherwise, it's all on the drummer, and he was good. Yeah, he was good. Um, the next track that you're about to hear, the red track, I did some checking on this, and I can tell you, let me, let me tell you this. The original Hillsongs track is recorded at 76.5 beats per minute. That's the tempo. 76.5. The track that I just played you, we did roughly at about 80, and that was fine. The track in red starts at 102 for this first intro here, these, these first measures. And it goes up and down from there. At one point, it got as high for four measures, I checked it. It was 180 for four measures. It gets down into the 90s. It gets down into the 80s. It goes back above 100. Um, and all this detracts from the song. Okay, and I, I want you to hear this. So, coming up on the red track. Same length of the intro. Okay, somebody needs to help them out with some EQ and some reverb. This stuff sounds very dry, and it's put out as a podcast, um, you know, not representing the church nearly as well as it could and as it should. Somebody doesn't know what they're doing on the equipment in there. Now, down below is our version. Our version is laid out side by side with Hillsong. It is 76.5 from start to finish. It never varies. And this is what you would hear if you were listening to Hillsong. Okay, so that's our intro. So verse 1 has um, uh, some of the principal players. It'll have the, uh, the bass player and the female lead. Those are the main ones that uh, are also on the, on the red channel. So let's listen to what we did at Lighthouse when I was in charge. Same singer now, same bass player, different drummer, and uh, also another female vocalist that really doesn't need to over oversing the lead. Too much caffeine. And now the way it really should be. I see the King of Glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes. The whole earth shakes. Yeah. All right, let's listen to verse two. I see the 
that's still the better version by far. Uh, the yellow one is good. It's not bad at all. We did a good job with that, especially for a live recording. So the click and guide helps keep you on track. It helps keep you together. It keeps your adrenaline in check. Because a lot of times when you're performing on stage, as you know, you're, you're really kicking it and you, you get that adrenaline rush and you're going, wow, you know. And the next thing you know, you're playing way too fast and you don't realize it. Or what happens sometimes is you'll, you'll have a song and it'll, you'll play part of it fast and part of it slow just because it's more intense or it changes significantly. Let's listen to, uh, to, to this, this verse. All right, you're beginning to get the idea here. I've got some other things I want to point out to you through the rest of the song. But, uh, you know, the worship leader assuring the quality, that's a big part of what you do here. And uh, we can see that there's definitely a side-by-side A-B comparison. The yellow version is clearly better than the red, and the blue version is better than both of them, quite frankly. When we choose to do a song that someone else has, has made famous, and this would be an example of one of those songs, you know, we are choosing it because it evokes a certain emotion and a certain message maybe for us. And we want to be faithful to that, particularly the emotion part. And the tempo has a lot to do with setting that emotion. So what we, we're finding here is that the faster it goes, the more jittery you get about it. You know, it's, it's like we're rushing to get out and beat the Baptists to lunch. You know, we've got to get this song over with, right? Uh, so it, we're, we're looking at some, some problems here. Also, being at the wrong tempo can really affect people badly. Now, I'm going to explain that to you here in just a moment uh, with a particular guitar example. But if you're going too fast, your singers can run out of breath. Your singers may not be able to pronounce the words properly or cram them all in, uh, depending on the song. That doesn't seem to be the case in this particular song, but uh, it, can, it can be a real problem. And um, you, you may also have the opposite problem. If it gets too slow, then you're having a problem with it uh, sounding like a funeral dirge and losing its feel in the opposite direction. You know, you're trying to faithfully recreate a, a, a version of the original song because your people probably know this song already you know, know most of the songs that you do and because of that you know they have certain expectations they listen to this stuff in the radio they have it on their phones or mp3 players or whatever else they might happen to have it on and uh, and they they listen to it so they have an idea how it goes Maybe they're not all slavish into it, but, uh, you know, if you don't provide something that reasonably fits within the expectations, then you're not going to reproduce the same feel or the same comfort level that you've got. And uh, it can be really distracting from the purpose of being together, which is to have corporate worship.
Let's listen to this chorus. Let me stop right there. Jeremy is an excellent guitarist. He plays all kinds of stuff and he does it very well. He had to learn that part and uh, he picked it out by ear and he played it. It took us quite a while that day to get it down to way, the way he, needs, he needed to do it. And it's so fast at points that you know, we really had to work to get a perfect take on it. So, the reason I mention that is, can you imagine playing that guitar part at 76, and then you show up for service, and your drummer is playing at 100 or 115? You know, you're really, really struggling to try to hit those notes. He was struggling at 76 because it's so fast toward the end. And I don't see how you could do it. I mean, I guess there's somebody could. Maybe with enough practice you could, but I mean to to be able to adjust on the fly like that, with a, because your drummer is not performing at the the level that the song is written at, that makes it hard on everyone. It makes it hard on the instruments. It makes it hard on the soloists like that, as well as it makes it hard on the singers because you know you practice it one way if you've done it right, and um, if you haven't done it right, I can't can't account for you. Uh, and then you show up and you get something very different because your drummer's on a, a different uh, planet than the rest of the uh, rest of the world. So you know that's part of the problems with uh, with tempo. You you need to keep the tempo concise and and under control. And even if you're not using a click all the way through, it, you need to have a, a rock solid drummer who stays very very close to that original tempo. Shop. 
stop right here and just tell you a little bit about Lisa real quick, my wife. She only started singing with us in February, I think it was, February, maybe March, February, I think, of about 2020, 2022. You know, she had never sung with us before, um, and she had no desire to be part of the band. I mean, it was just never a thing for her. She's kind of shy anyway. Uh, she wanted to sing one song with me, and uh, she was doing a harmony backup part. And that turned into a second song, and the band were like, you, you know, you're really good, and we don't have a good, strong female lead. You need to sing with us. And she kept doing one song, and then she would do two songs. And, you know, we were doing six songs a week, dividing them between three or four of us. And uh, so she would do one or two songs a week. Uh, and it became a great thing for us. But she never liked playing without the click track, okay? Uh, we did have a, a, a drummer, and we would let him play, my, my good drummer here, we would let him play without the click track. Uh, we would get him started with a click, and after the, after it got started, he took over and, and ran with it, and we followed him. Uh, but she never liked that format, because she liked to have the click going in her ear, and particularly the voice, because we had recorded voice guides in there that would say, chorus one, chorus two, you know, bridge, and if you you had a difficult transition part, I would put stuff in there like four, three, two, one, bridge, you know, something like that. Um, so this this stuff really helps you. Now, your younger people are learning this. Your older people, the guys who were raised on folk music in the 60s and 70s, you know, they're, they're not into this. And you have a hard time dragging them into it because they grew up with a different style of music, the Jesus movement kind of music. That was also sort of the hippie-related, folky kind of stuff in its its early days. It gave us what we have as CCM today, contemporary Christian music. So you got to drag those people along, and it's a harder drag because you know it goes against what they've grown up doing for years. But if you can get them on board, it's really a great thing for pulling the whole band together. And you got to look at the big picture. We're looking at getting the whole band together. It's one thing if you want to put a guy out front and let him play guitar. That's one thing. Let him do it. You know, let him let him have at it. But when you've got a bunch of people that need to be coordinated, this is the best way to do it. So listen to my wife now. She's only been singing for a little over a year at at this point with me, and um, we we only we left that church in August. So she's she and I've been doing this kind of stuff here at home since then. And just bear in mind, she's a rookie singer. No voice training. No, no choir beyond middle school. She had a middle school choir class. Nothing in high school. Um, and she doesn't really play any instruments. Pecks on the piano a little bit. But she doesn't really consider herself playing an instrument. But this is what you can do. You can take someone like that who doesn't have a lot of skills, doesn't really want to read sheet music, doesn't care about it, just wants to sing. and can do that without having to, you know, go through a, a long educational process. You listen to what's going on in your ears, and you follow that.
nuggets or some beer. Let's go back to the lighthouse version. chorus and the outro here of course get more intense and uh, this is the lighthouse Hosanna, Hosanna. I think we got a little bit fast right in here Church on the AM radio. Here we go. there and keep up, probably because of the tempo. It's hard to hit those licks. I have a lot of sympathy. Folks, I do not play lead guitar. But I do put together the blue stuff. Everybody knows when to quit because it says end. In fact, I'll just take a moment and I'll flip over here and just show you what this looks like, where I've got it put together. Um, this is all that I've done. All the background vocals, the instruments, everything is in there. Some of it's probably not even showing because I've got it hidden. But the click and guide system, like uh, going into, into verse 1 up here, just to show you how, how this would, would work. Instrumental. Four, three, two, verse one. I see the king of glory 
So you get the idea. The click and guide system is there, and it's there to make your life better and make your product better, not worse. And, and that's what it really does. Now, I've heard all kinds of excuses, as every other worship leader has who has tried to go to a system like this. They all meet resistance, and sometimes you just got to part ways with people, and you got to be good with that, you know. You, 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 can say you can still attend the church or whatever, but you know, you're know you not singing on the worship team if you're not going to get on board with us. So sometimes you got to take those stances, and uh, that's, that's part of the difficulty of leadership. You don't like it, but you have to do it. Anyway, um, no matter how, how much I tried to build into this, and by sending emails and stuff, uh, trying to get people acclimated to the idea, it didn't do any good, because the people who didn't want it didn't want it, and they weren't going to be convinced by anything that I had to say. So that was just the way, just the way it was. The um, people will say, well, you know, you're quenching the Holy Spirit because we, you know, we can't just pick up and play, you know, another verse if we want to. Actually, you can. There's multiple ways to do this kind of stuff. But I, I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit argument is nonsense. And I can say this because when you're listening to the original of Hosanna or Chris Tomlin or one of these other groups, and you're sitting there, you know, you're in the audience and you're just worshiping and you're having a good time and you feel like the Holy Spirit is moving in you, the Holy Spirit is using a click track. He's using a click track because all those artists use click tracks to keep themselves on time. Paul Beloche has a wonderful YouTube video series on the worship team, building a worship band and uh, how the click and guide system works, and he, he uses it when he has it. He conducts worship seminars all the time uh, where he encourages people who aren't using them to start using them, and so do I, because I've seen the results that it can get, and it, it just relieves so much stress when you don't have to wonder, was that too fast or was that too slow? We weren't recording it. We don't know. There's no way to check, and why would we waste time with that? So we, we go back and we play it again. You know, because we want to make sure we got it at the right tempo, okay? So those kind of things go away, and you can focus on your vocals, you can focus on your instruments, you can bring in new music, or you can do any number of other things that you would like to do instead of having to sit there and, uh, you know, dicker about whether it was too fast or too slow. Those issues go away. You don't have to wonder, you know, is the timing right that I'm coming into the right spot, you know, when I come in with my vocal? There's a guide telling you where to come in, you know. Uh, this allows your church to do more music as well, because, you know, most churches have a small set of music that they do. And um, part of the reason is because it, if you do it right, it takes a lot of time and practice if you're not using a click and guide system. So with a click and guide system, it takes away a lot of the problem, and you just have to work through, you know, actually playing along with the click and guide system. Some drummers don't like it, for example, because they can't throw in those licks that they are used to throwing in or want to throw in because maybe they're trying to overperform or be a little too flashy, you know. If you can't get it in within the time that's allotted, like the professionals do, then, you know, you don't need to be doing it. You know, it's one of those things you need to just say, eh, well, that was fun, but I'm not going to do that particular run at this point anymore. Or else I'm going to work on it until I get it in, like the professionals do. So that's your other option there. So um, I, I strongly encourage you not to let people deter you with these kinds of arguments. My mother once, uh, once uh, had a great line. I was about 18 years old. I was working a job at the radio station, and the, the boss was 33, and he went to, he played saxophone at a Church of God, Assembly of God, Deer, no, Deer Park Church of God, that's what it was. And uh, he said, oh, our preacher just stands up there and opens up the Bible and starts preaching whatever the Holy Spirit gives him to preach. Well, I was raised Presbyterian, and those guys showed up with manuscripts they had written, and they read them to us. And he couldn't understand how, how that could possibly work, you know, how could that possibly be, involve the Holy Spirit. So I was telling my mother this, because I didn't know what the answer was, and she says, well, can't the Holy Spirit work in advance? Duh! The Holy Spirit works in advance. The Holy Spirit works through planning. The Holy Spirit 
works through leaders who plan, and it works through musicians and singers who plan and who practice. It doesn't just, you don't just show up there and play the blazing lead guitar just because the Holy Spirit's moving you. That doesn't happen. You practiced before you got there, and you probably practiced a lot to learn to play like my friend Jeremy plays. So the whole idea of the Holy Spirit, that's just utter nonsense. You know, I think really what it is is that uh, musicians, you know, have a certain amount of adrenaline and dopamine that, that hits them. And so they, they like to be unrestrained. And if they hit that, get that feeling that hits them, they just want to keep going with something. And you can do that in these systems. But I'll, I'll tell you that all that stuff that you see at Bethel and Hillsong and all these things, those improv things, you know, all that stuff is planned. It's not just spontaneous. The, the worship leader didn't just stop and say, oh, well, let's just uh, let's play another verse of this. Now, that's not what happened. What happened was that they knew they were going to play another verse. They knew they were going to stop, and the, maybe the worship leader or somebody was going to was going to have a little uh, prayer rant or you know a pep pep talk, pep rally talk or whatever while the band is still playing, and they've got the click going. The click is just sitting there, click click clicking away while the the person is talking. And when the person gets finished talking, the people in the booth know that it's time to start the start the song back. So they've got the lyrics displayed on the screen properly. They know where they're going to. You know, all that stuff, it's fake, okay? It's not phony, but it's fake, okay? It's planned. It's pre-planned. It's called planned spontaneity. And it's been going on forever. When I was in Bible college in the 90s, uh, planned spontaneity would be something like, you know, you're singing out of the hymn, and then you'll say, let's do first three again, you know. Yeah, you kind of knew you were going to do that ahead of time, uh, so that everybody's that needs to know is kind of prepared for it. So it's been around forever. Uh, it's it's not going anywhere. So don't let the Holy Spirit argument get to you. There's nothing to it really. It's it's just it feels good for some people, and they feel like they're closer to God. And and of course that's what music is. Music somehow, whatever mystical magical thing that God has done for us, helps us draw closer to God. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to put together something that's quality for people so that you don't wind up having a bad performance that turns people off. I mean, would you go to a ballet and you watch one of the ballerinas turn out of time? What would you talk about? You know, you say, we went to see this professional ballet and one of the ballerinas was just not in time. You know, was, that would be the thing you would remember, not the rest of it, not the 99% that was perfectly great. And on time, you remember that that one ballerina kind of stuttered and, and had a problem there, because that would be the thing you would notice. And it's the same way with church. You go to church and you have a bad performance, poor performance, of, you know, in this case, you know, and a, a performance that kind of quells the emotion of the song and does, undermines its purpose. Then you, um, you know, people can come away with not the kind of good feeling that you want them to have. I, I felt jittery listening to that, like a, too much caffeine or something. The, um, the, the feeling that you want them to have is something good that they walk away. And the thing is, is they'll notice something bad that happens. But if you can eliminate as much of the potential bad as you can, the click and guide is one of the great ways to do that, then you're going to have a, a better performance. I mean, you're really serving God. We, we say we're going to give God our best, right? Well, a lot of times we show up on Sunday mornings and you know, we're just given whatever we've got at that moment. And it's not, uh, not because we, we, we didn't practice or whatever during the week. You know, we, we just are not doing as much as we could to make it as good as, as it could be. So we don't want to let those kind of things get in the way. I have never, ever heard anyone say, I went to that church down the corner, and you know what? The preacher was great. I really enjoyed it. The kid service was wonderful, but that band was too good. Yeah, that band was just too good. Yeah, they, they were too on time. Nobody screwed up. The singers hit all the notes. The instrumentalists came in on time. The band was together and tight, and the music was great. Yeah, I really can't go back to a church like that. It's just too good. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to be part of that. You know. Nobody says that. So 
the click and guide system is a great system. And I've written some articles and things on it that are, I'll put on in the links below. You can take a look at those things and, and see some of my other thoughts. I have some equipment recommendations. I mean, I have it. Uh, I like Phoenix Pro. It's a great entry-level thing. It's really affordable for, uh, for churches getting started in this because you do need to enter monitor systems. Anyway, I, I do hope that you uh, got something out of this. I hope you see the purpose uh, was to not really to denigrate anybody, but just to say this is what happens in churches all the time, Sunday after Sunday, week after week. And it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. I mean, even without the benefits of, of the recorded stuff that, that I've done and produced that was in the blue, the, the stuff that we did at Lighthouse that was in the yellow with all live players was still far superior. And it was because I worked with it. I worked with it a lot, a lot. And I worked on it a lot. And I worked on, when we started doing live streaming, I worked on getting the live streaming sounding like it should sound. So um, maybe that's not your forte, but if it's not, you need to find someone who can do it for you. And uh, you know, there's YouTube videos, there's how-to guides all over the place. Uh, this stuff is not secret, and somebody who has a desire can learn to do it and do it well. And that's what I hope you do. I hope you'll be encouraged by this. Um, I can tell you it won't probably make your people feel better. You can show them this video. You can show them 10 other videos. And on a very rare occasion, I find some worship leader who says he wishes he's never done this. I think that's insane because it's been the best thing for the quality music and bringing non-professional players together. If you've got a church in Nashville and all your, your band members are up-and-coming country music stars, then you rock it, baby. You just go ahead. Maybe you don't need a click and guide system. I think you still do. We have other issues that the click and guide helps also to address, like keeping us on time. Uh, particularly, you got multiple services or you're doing a radio broadcast or TV broadcast. You've got to get in on time and out on time. You know, so it helps with those kind of things in the planning. But regardless, this is something that I think all the small churches and medium-sized churches need to invest in and get used to because it's really the way of the future for the quality of music, and we want to give our best to, to the Lord in these things, and that's what I'm trying to help you do, help your church present its best face and uh, give glory to God in the process. So God bless you. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Come join us on the Sunday Serenade. You can look it up, Sunday Serenade. And it's on YouTube, also my Facebook page. And check out some more of the music that uh, my wife and I have recorded, along with Jeremy and Brother Gene. So, take care. God bless you.